Malcolm James McCormick had dreams bigger than the pipes his contemporaries offered him. He grew up in an eclectic religious family in Pittsburgh, with a Christian father and a Jewish mother, though he chose to live as a Jew. From a very young age, Malcolm possessed a creative obsession, teaching himself to play the piano at the age of six. An artistic mind trapped within the stillness of wooden desks and blue pens always gives way to a type of expression that is often deemed unacceptable. As he grew older and drunken parties and drug fueled arrests overwrote the narrative, he never lost sight of his dreams. He never closed the lid of the piano. And as he moved into his teens, as his eyes were opened to the potential of his passion, he decided to shift his perspective. He became a boy with a deathly focus on one thing that never left him, music. This fall my people will be riding to the top with their eyes on the guac to rule the tide. You winning out of looking flyer than a flock of birds smile to the haters. They jealous for that glide with my eyes upon the paper mackers. Rocking the scale with a pocket of skrill. I'm robbing, I'm still looking for a while of the bills. He let go of sport. He let go of parties. He let go of friends. He became obsessed until obsession became reality. For hours on end, he would teach himself music, piano, guitar, drums, bass, guitar, piano, drums. A tenacity gripped his every second, and this allowed success to come quick for a man so young. At 17, at the point of his potential, he released his premier album. Hmm. Hey, hey. I ain't normal, I'm clinically insane I guess it's the result of drugs that enter in my brain All of a sudden, every legend keep on mentioning my name It became a worldwide hit And now everyone knew the boy from Pittsburgh Then came the train that waits for no one Unless you're willing to run to catch it Fame, money, tours, cameras, microphones, buses, fans, screams Eyes, fatigue, bars, people, women, friends, anxiety, enemies, depression, drugs. He had dreamt of a life of music, not madness. Everyone looked to him, but he felt everyone looked at him. And for reasons unknown, the young boy with dreams that had burst the pipes long ago decided that his legacy was enough and died of a drug overdose in his home, alone. First and foremost, Mac Miller was a child of God. He set out to define himself as an artist, a creative desperately trying to overlay meaning in music. His life ended in his 27th year of life. Two thousand and eighteen has already taken the life of Anthony Bourdain, a man that exuded life and joy and sparked the hearts of the people he met and the fans that he entertained. From chef to television personality, Anthony Bourdain epitomised what many long for in life, though his personal life was marred by divorce and bitterness. While away filming, he hung himself in his hotel room, alone. As I watch these events unfold, I'm struck by the frailty of life, but more so the frailty of mental health. Suicide is somewhat of a taboo topic within the Christian faith, and for good reasons, I guess. Some say that it's a sin, and that essentially the person has committed murder by taking a life. Others are less quick to define it by anything other than tragic. It raises an important point in my mind concerning the state of mental health in the individual and the church's timidness to address it. It's as though as if we admit to the existence of mental health issues, we are somehow denying God and his ability to give us joy, hope, peace and life. But the reality is most people have no understanding at all of the nature of mental health. And many, many preachers still prescribe prayer as the antidote to all things mental. Mac Miller and Anthony Bourdain had lives that were full of purpose and meaning. You chose to give it up for reasons that we will never know. But maybe neither did they. It is more than a chemical imbalance and it is more than a feeling. It is complex and crippling. 
The truth of the matter is, for those struggling with mental health issues, the ability to reason and the responsibility to remain resolute is always questionable. And this has consequences for our understanding of suicide victims and those struggling with mental health issues. The question is, how can you judge a person's choices if their ability to choose is compromised? Suicide survivors will often recall the feeling of loneliness in their struggle and the desire to end life. But then the realisation and regret in realising the potential of what could have happened if they hadn't been saved, rescued, or even hugged. Why did you try to kill yourself? Um, hopelessness. There was no other option in my head. Couldn't see any way out. Depression, anger, guilt, shame. When you get to that absolute low point, or your brain makes you think certain things that aren't quite rational. When we're looking at someone who's suicidal and depressed, we often go, well, you know, they're just sad. Why can't they get over it? You're sad, but so smashed into this wall where you think that the future is just terrible. There's no chance. I have no idea of someone who's feeling so and horrible about themselves. The only way out is to end their life. I have no idea what that is like. Mac Miller was too young to die, and Anthony Bourdain was too delightful. Two men full of life at one point in time, yet so far from it at the end. For me, as a follower of Jesus, the reality of mental health gives me hope for people like this as it allows me to rest on the reality that God will never judge a person's choice on a perverted presence of mind. Jesus said he came to give life and life abundant, and the beauty of Jesus' words is that in order to obtain life, we need to look to life. And that means looking away from yourself, away from the negative, away from the devil in your ear, away from the hopefulness, to life. Mental health issues are complex and crippling, but they do not have to be catastrophic. They can be controlled. With the ear of a professional, the tenacity of your spirit, and the light of life shining down in your face as you look to Jesus. May you see yourself not as you perceive, but as Jesus proclaimed, a child of God, a child loved, a child with hope, a child never too far from his grace. I think I've got something to give. I've kind of learnt other aspects about myself that I had no idea were there. Strength, vulnerability, 